Hey guys, um, as, uh, as Dave was saying, my name is Adi Osmani. I work on the Chrome and Polymer teams at Google. And uh, today we're going to cover a few interesting things um, about what's new in the DevTools. Uh, we're going to start off with a whirlwind tour of new features, um, focusing on network performance. We're then going to do a jQuery performance case study. Um, and we're going to round it up with a debut of some more new features spanning the elements panel and your JavaScript debugging workflow. Now, a lot of people in this room um, are going to be focusing on building sites and apps which probably have to work well on mobile. Now, our users usually have a, a much better experience when the web is fast, which is why speed is one of the major factors in ranking now. Now, for a good user experience, we think that most pages should load in under a second, and animations and transitions should hopefully be hitting 60 frames a second. Any delay longer than that, and your users are going to feel a little bit flustered, and they're going to feel like it's a little bit harder to continue doing whatever they're, they're, you know, they came to your site to do. No one really wants to spend 30, you know, their, their 30s waiting for a page to load. It's not a good use of your time. Now, to help frame how you should think about performance this year, this is a new model um, that we think is useful to consider. Um, think of it as performance budgets for your user experience. So here, we first of all have load. So that's the initial load of your, your app or your site. Um, if you're using something like Service Worker, this is the restart experience that's supposed to be snappier and faster for your users. Um, then we have response. And this is like the input latency. It's the finger down experience when someone's trying to navigate around your site or, or interact with your UI. Um, we have animation. Uh, in the past, we've said that uh, it's good to, to try hitting 60 frames a second. Um, our advice there has is, is evolved a little bit. We're now saying that we think that if you're doing animations, you know, animating things across the screen, you should try to get that work done in six millisecond chunks. Um, and then we have idle time, which is you know, the time between your app or your site being in an, um, a stable state waiting for the, the next time the user is going to put their finger down. This is usually known as the, the finger up state. So we're saying that load, ideally try to load things in 1,000 milliseconds. Responses, 100 milliseconds is a good budget. Animation, 6 millisecond chunks. And then idle time of about 50 milliseconds. Now, if you want to visualize that, um, this is another way of looking at it. So you've got, first of all, got loading. You've got your finger down on glass experience. You've got animation chunks, and then the finger up experience once again. Now, these are attainable goals. And in the dev tools, we've been working on trying to make it a little bit easier for you to understand where time is being spent so you can hit some of these performance budgets. So let's talk about some of the new stuff that we've been doing inside the network panel, first of all. Now, today's DevTools network panel, um, this, is, this is on the bottom, really only has like two times available. Um, it's got receive time and, and everything else. Now, what would be even more useful is like color-coded resource time. Um, that's more useful than resource type. And uh, web page test uh, at the very top, so this is the web page test waterfall. Um, they already use color coding um, for their timing, timing information. So uh, what we've done is in um, the Canary DevTools, We've now actually overhauled um, the waterfall. The waterfall bars now show where time was spent, um, a lot like web page test. Uh, the legacy color coding uh, uses resource type, but that's not really useful for communicating um, you know, the behavior of a request or that uh, proxies are actually slowing all your network requests down by 50%. Um, seeing all of these requests at a glance um, can help you understand some of the potential wins you can get um, out of your app. Um, you can easily see you know, whether a fast TLS fetch is occurring, whether you've got a slow time to first byte. And in fact, what would be even more useful is if we actually just dove into some demos. So let's do that. So here I've got The Verge. Um, it's a news site. For anyone that, that doesn't know about it, it's a little bit like a newspaper. Newspapers are those things that have news from like two weeks ago, where it's a little bit more up to date. So here I've gone and I've recorded um, a new waterfall timeline. Um, and the first thing I'm going to do is actually go and right click on the, the header and select time. Now time is really useful for, for trying to understand um, what network requests took the, the longest period of time to go and fetch. And hovering over them now, you can actually see how much time was spent and where it was spent. So here, for example, proxy negotiation was an issue. This other request, um, content being downloaded and the initial connection um, took the longest amount of time. Now, you might be wondering what these, uh, these blue and red bars that are now on the waterfall uh, mean. Uh, the DevTools docs cover this well, but basically they correspond with DOM content loaded and load events. So DOM content loaded is blue, and load events are in red. 
Now we're heading back into the network panel, and I'm actually going to go um, over to uh, filters. I'm going to toggle filters, uh, filter down to just scripts, and go and look for a script. So there are a bunch of ads on this page. Um, what you can now do is, is right click on any file in the network panel, and you can go and directly open it up in sources. You don't have to go and look for it. You don't have to worry about where the file might be. You can go and use pretty print, try to read the source. Um, just a little bit of a, of a nice convenience ad. Um, we find it useful. Um, going back to the network panel, uh, another, so just clearing that filter, another thing that we've added, um, and I'm right clicking once again, is uh, some improvements to Initiator. Now, Initiator is useful for trying to understand um, what went and initiated a request. So we can actually group these. We can click on the header to group these. Um, this page has a lot of ads, and other generally corresponds to things like iframes, which we now try to indicate. Um, data URIs are probably going to show up as parser. Uh, we have a number of other items where script is responsible for going and fetching requests. Now, um, I'm going to hop over to chrome.com, where I have uh, another new column enabled, and this is protocol. Protocol, in this case, allows me to see that um, the latest version of HTTP2, so H2.14, um, was actually used to serve up this content. And uh, because there are some mixed types here, you'll see that some of these resources were loaded over Speedy. Um, again, just some more insights into the, the amount of data that's available for you to, to look at. Um, another thing we've been working on is improved filters in the network core panel. So here, for example, I'm using the, uh, the method filter to filter down get and post requests to see what data was fetched and, and what data is being sent. There's a domain filter now as well, so you can filter down by domains and subdomains. Um, that's pretty useful as well. We've got a, another filter available for MIME types. So if you want to filter down to an application JavaScript or you know, image GIF, that, that's available and it's definitely useful. Um, something else we recently added was uh, the idea of a negative text filter. Um, a negative text filter basically allows you to say, show me all of the data except this one thing. And you can do that just by passing in a dash uh, before a keyword. So here, for example, I'm showing all the files except my scripts. Um, I can do the same thing with CSS. Now, uh, some people might notice that there's a new preserve log option, a checkbox at the very top. Um, this is useful for, uh, for a few reasons, but uh, we're just going to go check it. Um, and then I'm going to start navigating around the rest of the Verge. Um, and what's going to happen is every time I navigate to a new page, it's actually going to append the waterfall for that new page to the, the current waterfall. So I can actually um, use this to figure out you know, what the network performance is like across my entire site. I don't have to go worrying about doing this on a per page basis. So that's pretty useful. Um, we're going to take a break from the Verge.com and head over to sfgate.com, another interesting site. Um, now what we're going to do here is we're going to dive into uh, the DevTools device mode. So that's just the, the phone icon over there. Um, I'm going to go and I'm going to emulate uh, the Google Nexus 5 device, first of all. And I'm then going to use the, uh, the network throttling option. Now, network throttling is actually really, really useful, but it's something that we should all be using because um, a lot of the time when your users are accessing your pages, they're probably going to be doing it um, you know, on a train or from a hotel or a conference or somewhere where they've got a spotty connection. So I've gone and I've enabled um, 2G. And I'm just going to go and, and refresh this page. Um, it's gone. It's, it's requesting resources. It's, um, it's still going and still going. You'll see it's fetching stuff. It's just not painted anything on the screen. One of the uh, items on my bucket list is to uh, outlive this page fully loading. Um, we now have some content. We have, uh, we have an image. We have um, some structure. But uh, otherwise, it's, it's kind of difficult for me to, to use this site. Um, they didn't really do any testing on, on slightly you know, slower connections. And that's probably something they should have taken a look at. So that's some of the new stuff that we've introduced inside of um, the network panel. We're going to dive into uh, a performance case study next. So lately, the DevTools team um, have been diving in to do some performance case studies of popular sites. Um, one of the first ones we did was wikipedia.com. Um, specifically, we were looking at the, the Wikipedia editor. Um, and it turns out that uh, they were using jQuery. Um, uh, and visibility toggling was a major bottleneck for them. It actually slowed, slowed down their application quite a lot. Uh, and that totally surprised them. Now, off the back of this, uh, Paul Irish came up with this, this recommendation that he tweeted out saying, you know, never use jQuery's hide method ever. Classes are your friend. And what he meant was that you should never use hide or toggle or the visible or hidden selectors because they're going to call get computed style behind the scenes before going and setting inline style. 
um, he was suggesting using, you know, add, remove, toggle class instead. Now, um, I was talking to Paul, and he wanted me to, first of all, say sorry. Um, because he kind of broke the first rule of performance profiling. Um, it should be tools, not rules. Uh, so what we're kind of trying try doing here is uh, break down why Paul reached some of the conclusions that he did and uh, talk about you know, some, some potential recommendations off the top of that. So the first thing we're going to do is dive into the timeline and switch on two brand new options, Causes and the JavaScript Profiler. And these are hugely useful. Um, causes explain what's happening in the timeline. They're super useful for seeing what caused layout invalidations, recalc styles, forced layout. Um, and then we have JavaScript sampling. This is now integrated directly inside the timeline. So you can get call stacks visualized here right next to information about your rendering performance, your paint, your layout. Um, super, super useful stuff. So we go and we do a first load um, timeline recording of uh, the Wikipedia editor. And we end up with what looks like three acts of work. In fact, I've got a recording of what this looks like just to, to help visualize it a little better. So here we've, we've gone, we're uh, trying to load up this Wikipedia page with the editor. We've got some content that's loaded up. Um, I still don't have any editor on screen. It's finally been able to get into the progress loader state. Um, it's still doing work, still doing a lot of JavaScript execution behind the scenes. Um, I still don't have all this content fully loaded or rendered to the page. Still doing a lot of work. We're into 24 seconds now. Um, still going, still going. And then around 30 seconds, we hi finally have all of our content fully loaded up. It's taking just way too long. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, tackle this um, in three different acts. Now, the first act um, is going to talk about the editor notices. So Wikipedia has got an edit notice system. Whenever you're trying to edit an article, um, it's going to show you notices saying, you know, you've got permissions to edit this or not and any news on the site. Um, what Wikipedia did was they wrote a jQuery get visible text plugin to determine if a notice is visually empty and filter those out. Great idea. Um, helps them figure out if notices need to be hidden or not. Um, we profiled this and discovered that there are some pretty hefty recalc styles here. And one of the major reasons for this is because they're using the hidden selector. Now, hidden isn't exactly part of the CSS spec. Um, and jQuery can't really take advantage of too many performance boosts from using query selector all because this is a custom selector. Now let's take a look at how Wikipedia are using this in their editor. Um, I've highlighted it with this, this blue line. So they're first of all dynamically building DOM, then using add class, using the HTML method, and they're then using this get visible text plugin, which is using hidden to determine visibility. Now in jQuery for hidden, um, an element is assumed to be hidden if uh, it or any of its parents consume no space in the document. This makes sense if you've, you've been following the jQuery source for a while, but if not, this is going to kind of surprise you because uh, CSS visibility isn't taken into account at all. Um, because they're querying uh, properties like offset width and offset height, there's also the potential for layout or reflow um, to occur there because the browser is going to have to apply all the scheduled changes, flush the queue, and do some layout to give you the, uh, the most up-to-date values. Um, one possible recommendation off the back of this is to be careful when you're using the hidden selector. Um, ideally, use your own logic to compute visibility, particularly if you're building anything that's super high performance and needs to, to, to you know, be as fast as possible. You could use something like element.hidden. Um, there are plenty of other options available to you as well. So next, uh, here's another expensive block. It doesn't really matter what this is doing, um, but we're going to take a look at the source of the parent function here. Um, again, I've highlighted with blue the area of interest to us. Um, we have three to four calls at the very top. Nothing too crazy going on here. We're querying for a figure. We're plucking an image and a caption from there. Um, and then we assume that our use of jQuery's children method here um, is probably you know, getting child nodes and running matches selector um, on each of them. But there's actually a lot more going on here behind the scenes. Now we go back to our timeline, and we see at the very bottom um, of our recording that there are a ton of little blue parse HTML blips at the bottom. Um, we dug in deeper, and we discovered that this is actually um, Sizzle's code for handling query selector all regular expressions. It's a little bit weird that it's getting hit every single time in this particular case. Um, we dug a little deeper. We noticed that there are a bunch of set document calls on pretty much any one of these stacks. 
Um, and this is actually due to a potential bug in Sizzle where set document is called and there's some expensive processing being performed pretty much every time jQuery is used on a document that isn't window.document. I believe this is something that they're currently looking into, um, but what Wikipedia ended up doing in this case was just dropping their use of the uh, children method, just you know, handling that logic themselves. They got some nice performance boosts out of it. Um, Advice there, be careful with using the children method. Um, I'm sure that there are plenty of things that Wikipedia were doing here that could have been better. Um, also, you know, where possible, just use query select raw and regular DOM methods. They're, they're generally quite fast these days. Um, if the abstraction that you're working with is something you don't fully understand, you know, be careful there. Uh, for Act 2, we're going to jump directly into the JavaScript CPU profiler. So this is usually in the profile section. Now, um, we did a profile here, and we noticed that there's this one method, oo.copy, that's doing a lot of JavaScript work. Um, behind the scenes, they're actually using the jQuery HTML method quite a lot um, in this, this uh, other method called convert, uh, convert to data. Um, Wikipedia are currently working on uh, eliminating their excessive you know, HTML calls. But let's take a look at just one instance of where they were fixing this up. They switched over from using jQuery's HTML method um, to just working with create element with inner HTML. Um, those methods are massively faster, at least for, for this particular use case. Um, and they don't have as much overhead because all of the edge cases that jQuery takes care of for you um, aren't, aren't, aren't you know, having to, to be baked in. Um, another thing that jQuery, sorry, not jQuery, but Wikipedia were doing here that is sort of their fault is um, they were doing a lot of HTML method calls like pretty repetitively where it made more sense for them to just batch that stuff. The advice there is if you find it to be a bottleneck, avoid using the HTML method for DOM insertion. Use inner HTML or DOM methods. Um, Instead of stamping out HTML into DOM a ton of times, just use inner HTML once. Uh, you can use document fragments as well if you just need to add things to the page one time. Um, jumping back in to our profiler, we can look at our CPU profile some more, and we notice that there's this one method, this one section of our code, create surface. Um, it's actually taking up a, a third of the editor initialization time. We can dive into the timeline, and we see that this is actually responsible for some uh, pretty hefty recalc styles of over 100 milliseconds. Now, if we look at the source for this, um, they're using the C they're doing a bunch of stuff, but they're using the CSS method um, for for setting visibility and removing hidden classes, which actually leads us to our largest bottleneck in the app, uh, curse CSS. Uh, if you say this fast enough and you're drunk, it sounds like curse, but that's a totally separate thing. Um, it's the biggest bottleneck, and um, a lot of the work is coming from their use of show and hide. You can see that hide here is taking up 319 milliseconds. Now, um, this isn't just you know, the, the, the only instance of this. Uh, we looked at the entire app, and there were a lot of cases where you know, there were 100 millisecond blips in recalc style just because of curse CSS and the way that it was being used here. Um, lots of element.hide and element.css method usage for, uh, for hidden um, visibility toggling. Now, if curse CSS sounds familiar or, or doesn't, um, you'll see it when you're digging in the source for jQuery CSS method. Um, if a computed value exists for an element, it's just going to use curse CSS to go and, and set your styles for you. Now, Wikipedia were kind of shocked when they discovered that the hide and show methods were the largest bottlenecks in their app. They figured that they were using you know, pretty standard jQuery stuff. They didn't realize that this might be a problem for them. Um, Unfortunately, you know, although hide and show are really convenient to use, there's a, there's a lot of magic happening behind the scenes. jQuery calls get computed style, once again, um, before setting any inline styles for visibility. And that's a good way to cause layout by accident. Um, they're doing it to support two particular edge cases. Um, let's say that you have a, you know, a div or an element that has display none or it, on it, or you have some inner styles um, with some custom display values that you also, once again, want to use show or hide on. Um, Dave Methvin tells me that jQuery are exploring um, ways of making this stuff faster, uh, which is really great to hear. Um, but in summary there, um, avoid using hide for high performance visibility toggling. Uh, once again, this comes back to understanding the abstractions that you're using and, and exactly what it is that they're, they're doing. If you're using a, a library or a framework, you should generally understand what's going on behind the sheets. Um, so avoid hide for high performance visibility toggling. Just use add, remove, toggle class where possible. Track visibility on your own. Try to avoid using get computed style um, to ask for information. 
Now, Act 3, I'm not really going to spend too much time on. It's, it's more or less a mixed bag of some of the stuff that we saw before. Um, Wikipedia had a pop-out widget that was causing a lot of recalc styles. Turns out that was because of show and hide usage. Um, they had a lot more uh, HTML method usage that should have been batched. Um, and they had a big recalc style of 300 milliseconds. In their use of animate for animating visibility, um, they ended up switching that out for custom logic and just using CSS transitions. The overall advice there isn't, you know, don't use jQuery. I'm certainly not saying that. Um, what I'm saying is if you think it's slow, you think something's slow in your app, go and profile it. Understand what your bottlenecks are. So summary here um, for this part of the talk is uh, jQuery is not your friend for high performance visibility toggling, at least today. Um, try tracking visibility on your own rather than using hidden visible show and hide. Avoid using the HTML method for DOM insertion if it's a bottleneck for you. Um, keep your DOM size low. We didn't really cover this in, in great depth, but um, one thing we noticed in this, in this particular example was um, a lot of our bottlenecks were, were also down to, uh, to Wikipedia having over 14,000 elements in their editor. That's crazy, right? 14,000 elements. Um, one, one possible recommendation we have is keeping your DOM size low where possible. Um, if you have uh, less than 1,000 DOM elements in your page and under 30 layers, at least on the Chrome side, we can give you slightly more predictable performance. Um, and just try to touch the DOM list, batch changes where it makes sense. Next, we're going to take a look at um, some of the brand new other features that we've been adding to the DevTools, stuff that I think everyone's going to find useful. So the first thing we've added is a brand new color dropper. Um, so let's say you're on a page, um, you go and you use the color picker. We now have a brand new eyedropper um, in the elements panel for going and just selecting anything in the page, whether it's an, an image or a background color or some component UI or a palette. You can go and select a color and just go and toggle it without having to use any external tools for this. Um, I use this all the time. It's extremely helpful. It's kind of cool. The next thing um, we've added is a new layers and paint profiler. So let's say that you've got um, some, some complex, beautiful looking UI. Um, this is the Timpanist Polarize Gallery. I've just gone and I've enabled the paint checkbox. I'm interacting with this app and recording in timeline. And the paint checkbox is useful for just understanding the graphics layer positions and the images that have been painted. But I've gone, um, I've, I've made my recording. And uh, I'm just going to wait for the, uh, the records to be retrieved. Great. We're going to select what looks like an expensive piece of work in this app. Um, and what I'm now going to show you is I've selected a chunk of that work. And this is the new layers panel, um, which shows you where layers were created and why. It'll show you why elements have particular dimensions, memory estimates, reasons for compositing, um, portions of the page that were uploaded to the GPU for, for compositions. Um, for anyone that doesn't know what compositions are, it's when you know, a, a layer is uploaded to the GPU. You probably incur it when using something like the translate Z hack or will change. Um, so this allows you to basically go and, and understand in more depth um, what's going on with the paint side um, of, your, of your application, what's actually uh, being drawn to the screen. So again, a summary of all the activity um, is available on your very right. Um, another new thing that we've added is the Paint Profiler. Um, now, the Paint Profiler um, is something I'll be toggling in a second. But uh, right now, again, you go and we toggle it. And what this is going to allow you to do is see the draw calls that were executed to the browser to draw this page. You can actually scrub to find portions um, of this that you were interested in. So here, for example, we're actually seeing every single step the browser took to draw this thing onto the screen. And if you find that a particular thing on your page is super, super slow, this is like advanced timeline. This is really, really useful stuff. We use it all the time. Um, and we hope that you're going to find it useful. Another thing we've got is the ability to go into 3D mode. Now, this isn't, this isn't fake 3D. This is actually like proper 3D. You'll get to see all of the stacks, all the layers in your page. You can inspect each of them, understand which of them are slow, which of them are a performance bottleneck for you. So that's the, the new layers panel and paint profiler. We hope you'll, you'll go check them out. Um, the next thing we've added is uh, improved controls for web animation playback. So here I've got a demo from um, another demo from Timpanus. Um, and what you'll notice is that uh, this actually includes changes for DOM animation. So DevTools will now highlight um, your DOM updates. So I'm going, I'm interacting with this. You'll notice that it highlights all the class names that changed on nodes um, as we were going and, and playing around with the animations here. Uh, this is kind of useful for just understanding what changed um, in case you're unsure about you know, the classes being used to toggle animation controls. Uh, let's go to another demo. 
Uh, this is a 3D NES controller. Um, let me go into full screen mode so that you guys can see this a little bit better. So this is a full screen um, NES controller. I'm actually now hovering over the position and margin sections, which will show you all of the, uh, the positional information that you can edit. And uh, what, I, what we now have is the ability to control playback of animations. So here I've gone and I've paused my CSS animation. Um, I can go and now control the speed of this animation. I can make it slower if I want to. I can make it faster. Um, and this is just really useful for tweaking and fine tuning the animations in your page. Um, we hope you're going to find this useful. This is, this is sort of part one of some broader work that we're doing um, into animation tooling. Um, this is, is something experimental, so you know, might or might not happen. But this is the next evolution of that same UI. Um, it's basically a visual overview of all the animated properties in your page. Um, you're going to be able to resize to control duration, drag things around to control the delays, and you basically have access to performance tooling, like high performance tooling for properly tweaking all the animated properties in your pages. Um, that stuff's in experimental mode at the moment. Um, hopefully, it'll, it'll land and, and end up as a stable thing. Um, so this is Leah Veru's uh, Cubic Bezier Editor um, tool. Uh, here you can go and play around with Cubic Bezier functions. You can play around with duration and seconds. You can go and select different functions that she's uh, pre-configured here. Um, something that we've uh, just added to the dev tools, uh, in fact, is something that's going to help with this a little bit. We open up the elements panel. Um, we're going to go and, uh, and highlight one of the, uh, the elements she was animating. So I guess this, this current, this first item. And what you'll notice now is if I go and I click on the Cubic Bezier, we have a brand new Cubic Bezier editor built into the DevTools. This allows you to edit timing functions, um, visualize animated timing function CSS properties, and at the very bottom, we have presets for easing formulas. So you don't have to go and you know, Google this stuff yourself. You can just go and flip through those as much as you want. You can control the curves. We hope, once again, this is going to help people that are building you know, really rich animations in their UIs and their mobile apps. Um, so check that out. Now, um, something that, uh, that you might also find useful is this next feature. Um, this is a feature that's going to help people that like using JavaScript libraries and frameworks. Um, I tried picking a framework I like, but uh, I don't start drinking that early. Um, <laughs> so here we've got a to-do app. Um, I've gone and I've set a breakpoint. Um, on a, so that any time I go and I add a new item, it's just going to go and trigger here. Um, what's going to happen now if I try to step through this function, so using the, the tools at the bottom, if I go and try stepping through this function, um, what's going to happen is uh, something nice and, and unexpected. It's going to dive into Angular instead of actually diving into my, my library code. I continue stepping through this, and it's going to continue stepping through Angular rather than my own source. This is something you've probably run into when you're using jQuery or jQuery UI or Ember or whatever else you happen to like using. Um, and it's kind of a pain in the butt. Now, something that we've added recently is the ability to just right click on a script and black box it. Now, black boxing basically denotes library code that we want to write around. Um, the debugger is not going to jump into that file when you're stepping through. So you can go back to your source. We're going to just restart this process a little bit. I'm going to try adding in another to-do item here. And when we now step through our code, so let's just zooming in here, you'll see that there are stack frames that have been hidden. They've been black boxed. Um, if we now try stepping through our code, what you'll see is we're stepping through our source, not stepping through the library source. This is incredibly useful. Um, the debugger is not going to jump into that file when you're stepping through. Library exceptions aren't going to pause. Um, stepping in or out or over um, is going to bypass the library. And you can actually go and pre-configure all the libraries that you want to black box directly inside the settings pane. Um, so that's definitely something that, that might be of interest to you. Another thing that we've recently added is, uh, is this feature. So let's say that we've got some script that we're just trying to run inside the dev tools. Um, what you'll notice here is I just pasted that in, and it detected that there was an error. This is due to proactive compilation. Um, what that basically means is that any edits that you make inside the dev tools um, are going to be proactively compiled by V8 so you can detect errors early. You can be debugging your app, you know, set it up using workspaces, and you'll just be able to catch errors um, a lot more quickly. One last thing. So I've got one last thing. This is debut. Um, so let's say you like working with promises. 
Now, normally, if you're debugging promises, you're probably going to be using console logging or debugger statement or something like that. Um, what we've just added, and this will be coming soon, is a brand new promises panel um, for understanding how long it took to resolve um, your promises. You can visualize them. We go into the promises panel now. We'll see that we've got unresolved promises that are instantly you know, resolved and fulfilled. Um, you can go and click on any of these lines here and dive directly into where the promise was initially defined um, or where any chaining behavior was defined. You'll see the, the time to settle as well. Um, if we go and dive into a, a very, very, very quick other demo of this exact same thing, very, very quickly, um, <laughs> you'll also see that it's possible to see um, promises that were um, unfulfilled or which just weren't able to resolve correctly and were rejected. Um, you can, once again, go and dive in and see the source lines where they were defined, um, time it took to settle. You can filter them down by what was fulfilled, what was rejected. And the um, last thing is uh, you might be wondering what this, <laughs> this async button at the very corner of this checkbox does. I have a very, 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 very quick demo of this. So this is a piece <laughs> that has news stories on it that get appended every time you try to, to refresh the page. We're going to go and very quickly set um, a break point here. And um, <laughs> off the stage in a minute, Abby. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.